for the Presbyterians and Tom Brady a little bit ago. He's still retired, okay. so he's still not going to be playing. Uh, but I uh, had a good time with the Presbyterians this morning and, and uh, with the Lord. We, I know we have some folks out that are not able to be with us today, but those of you who ventured out were bold enough to come and be in the house of the Lord, we salute you and you'll be blessed for that. Very much so. I want to give some thanks to some more people. We, we gave out some uh, of that last week, but I'd like to give a little bit more. Um, I'm grateful, very grateful for Nancy Lee helping with our blessing garden and those who work with her. I know you have some other ladies that helped you, but she worked real hard. It was sort of out of mind here this time of the year, but the blessing garden has actually been a blessing to a lot of people. And I think they're planning to try to expand it a little bit more. And that, that would be very nice in light of everything. And uh, so I, I just thank uh, Nancy and Lee for it. She had the vision for it and she's put the work in. I think she got uh, Edward to help her every now and then. <laughs> You broke, broke Tim in on that vision, but that's, that's good. Yeah, we all get roped in on those things. Uh, and I also want to give a real thank you to uh, Joe. He, he doesn't probably want me to say this, but there's been a lot of projects that's been done around here the last year and a half or two. I'm talking about big projects that required getting bids, going after people, making phone call after phone call. Uh, I mean, these were long processes to get windows put in back there in the daycare area. Took a lot of time, a lot of visitation, a lot of seeking out bids, and then seeing it through. And all these different projects has been done, putting roofs on the buildings, fixing all these things that need to be fixed. Joe has had the responsibility of getting those bids and getting those people here and seeing that the work was done correctly, seeing that they got paid correctly. So do give Joe some thank you. He, he gives a lot of his time and donates his time here. Uh, and do, uh, do thank him for that because there's a lot of things that's been done here because he had to see it through from beginning to end. And there was a lot of things that were involved in the in-between from beginning to end. So do thank Joe for his time that he has put in to this church. And for some of us here, uh, church is our life. It's, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's the main part of our life. We do other things. We work and we, we go places. We eat every now and then, sometimes pretty often. But church is our life. I mean, it's, it's, it means more to us than almost any. God and church is, is the center of our, of our universe many respects. It's just true. And I can't think of anything else to surround your life around than God and His church and His people. Today, with uh, I just wanted to do something with Valentine's coming up Tuesday, and I, I wanted to do this subject anyway, and this was just a good time to do it. The limitless, unfailing love of God. The limitless, unfailing love of God. We sang that, I think, last week or so. The love of God reaches far. The tongue of men can ever tell. Goes beyond, far beyond anything we could ever imagine. Father, thank you for speaking to us today. That we'll leave here being one time, once again, convinced how much you love us and how great and vast and unlimited your love really is. Thank you, Lord. Everybody said amen. amen.
I've quoted this to you a number of times, but I'm going to do it again today. The philosopher Faber said, to understand the love of God, you, you can't wrap your mind around it. He said, to understand the love of God is darkness to my intellect. In other words, my mind can't grasp it. My mind can't wrap around the love of God. It's just too, too vast and too great. He said, the, the love of God is darkness to my intellect and my understanding, but it's sunshine to my soul. What the mind can't totally comprehend, our souls, our hearts can bask in the beauty, the depth, and the greatness of God's love. Don't you think we all need that kind of love. A love that is limitless. A love that is unfailing. A fountain of love that never, never runs dry. A fountain of love that never runs out. Aren't you glad God's love never runs out? Even with thick old people. Look around. Look around. I hate to say it, but it's the truth. People are just a little bit fickle. The children of Israel, you know, they're one time they're serving the Jehovah God, and the next few weeks later they're serving other gods, and then they repent and they're back to serving Jehovah God, and then they stray. We've sung songs. Edward, uh, I've got peace like a river and love maybe like a fountain or an ocean you know f flowing in our souls John 3.16 is a good base to base off of for God so loved the world John 3.16 is a, a verse that one word describes the next words. The one word describes the next words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. Wow. Wow. Sheila Wash says, in all of literature in the world, nothing can compare with the treasure contained in these 25 words. And these 25 words have changed the world. 25 words have changed the world. It changed your world may have changed your family. The great doctrines of the Bible are in that one verse. The doctrine of God and love and creation and grace and incarnation and faith and hell and heaven and redemption is all in that verse. It's all there. Max Licato has said to reduce it to eight words I love this. He loves, he gave, we believe, we live. Don't you like that? Amen. He loves, he gave, we believe, and we live Amen. eternal life. Come on. Look, look, Max McKay also said, John 3.16 is the hope diamond of the Bible. It begins with God and ends with life. The hope diamond. We have a lot of women who are looking for hope and looking for diamonds. We, Joe and I went to Smithsonian's and we saw a hope diamond. They didn't let us try it on. I don't know why. 
they kept it under lock and key. But John 3, 16 is the whole diamond of the Bible. In many ways, it's true. And Graham Lott, Billy Graham's daughter, which we, we love her, and she's a great author, a great minister of the, of the things of God. She says, John 3.16 is the North Star of the Bible. The North Star of the Bible. If you align your life with it, it'll get you home. How many plans to, to go home with John 3.16? It's the North Star that will get you home. I like that. Someone has said, it's a picture of undeserved, unwavering love from a father to his kids. My father wasn't the kind of person like most men. He just wouldn't say it on an often basis, I love you. But when he did say it, it was pretty amazing. Men, you know, men and women are different. Women speak a lot more words than men. If you can get a word out of a man, you've done something. They're islands to themselves. Man, it's just the way it is. But my father, he actually was at my ordination, and I was ordained in Memphis, Tennessee, at the First Assembly of God Church, where Elvis Presley's mother went, and the pastor there was her pastor, and he ministered and tried to minister to Elvis numerous times. I was, I was ordained in that church, and that pastor and my father, who was present, prayed over me for my ordination. When I stood up, my father said, I love you, son, and I am proud of you. That means a lot, doesn't it? God loves us. I said, God loves us. The saddest people on the face of the earth. Let me tell you who they are. The saddest people on the face of the earth are people who cannot receive love, neither can they give love. They're the saddest people. And there's one thing you can add to that. These kind of people never learn to obey. They, they couldn't obey their teachers in grammar school, so they had to maybe have to have someone else to tell them the rules, and they couldn't obey that, and eventually, you know, it becomes a lifelong thing of, of finding somewhere that you have to obey somebody, and sometimes these people wind up in places that are not very nice, incarceration or whatever. The people, the saddest people are those who cannot receive love and cannot give love. The psalmist in Psalms 37, speaking of God's love, your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. We just sang that, Edward. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Verse 7, how precious, priceless, faithful, abundant is thy steadfast, unfailing love, O oh God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Now I did numerous translations there to give you all the translations. How many knows that God's love is precious? How many also agree that it's priceless? Faithful, abundant, steadfast, unfailing love. Oh God. We can say like the poet, Oh love that will never let me go. I give my heart to thee. And 1 John 4, 9, 4 19 says, We love him because he first loved us. Come on. This love of God that God loves. 1 John 4, 16, God 
is love. Exclamation. God is love. Not an occasional love. Not a conditional love. Not a sporadic love. Not a fair weather love. But God is love. Period. Amen. That's it. God is love. God's love is based solely upon his nature and power to love and nothing else. Listen, you cannot win his love by goodness and you cannot lose his love by badness. God is love. That's his nature. He has that power to love and nothing else. God's love for me is not based upon what I do or how I do or if I love him back. God is love. Period. That's it. Now, you can't win his love and you can't lose his love, but you can resist his love. Repeat that again. You can't win it, you can't lose it, but you can resist it. It's true. The love of God is consistent, pure, rich, deep, unfailing, vast as the heavens. When Paul wants to describe the love of God, he can't avoid using the word deep. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you be able to feel and understand as all of God's children should how long, how wide, how deep, how high, how high His love really is and so experience this love for yourself and so experience this love for yourself and so experience this love for yourself though it is so great that you will never see the end of it or fully know or understand it and so at last you will be filled up with God himself because God is love. And if you dig deep into the soil of God's marvelous love, you'll find that love is full and rich and deep. It's wide. It's great. It's high. It's long. It's love. It really is the love of God. Paul says, dig deep. I think sometimes we just don't dig deep enough into that reservoir or to that soil of his love. In verse 17 and 18, he says, dig deep into the soil of God's love and discover, verse 18, discover how deep his love really is. <clears throat> Listen. His love is deeper, deeper than any hurt that you could ever have. I said God's love is deeper than any hurt or trial or situation of life that you will ever go through. It's deep enough for you. And it's great enough for you. In chapter 15 of John, Jesus says, I have loved you just as I have loved the Father. The Father has loved me. You must abide, you must remain in my love. We call that abiding in Christ. I am the vine, ye are the branches, God says. I am the vine, ye are the branches. God is the vine dresser. Jesus is that vine that we are connected to. We're the branches. And the life that comes out of Christ comes into the vine, into us. Abide in my love, he says. 
Remain, abide. Max Lucado describes this. To abide in Christ's love is to make his love your home and not a roadside park or a weekend getaway. But your preferred dwelling place. When the thunder claps, you are beneath his roof. When his walls secure you from the wind, his fireplace warms you from the cold. It's time to abandon the old house of false love and move into the house of real love, the love of God, which is greater far. Amen. Come on. The real love of God. John 15, 3, 13 goes on down that chapter 15. There is no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And then in verse 15, he says, No longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. Don't you think that's where the guy who wrote the song, I'm a friend of God, don't you think he read that one day? And said, I think I'll write that as a song. I'm a friend of God. You know, I, I may be a little bit guilty of name dropping because of some of my experiences that I've had with, you know, having Johnny Cash at my church. And, I, you know, I, I, you tell the story not really trying to do the name drop, but it kind of hearts part of the story. But if you're going to do a name drop, the best drop name you can give is, I'm a friend of God. And God's a friend of me. I'm a friend of God. Come on. What could be any better than that? My gracious. He calls me friend. The God of the universe who created the stars. Listen, if you get into a rocket or a plane going 600 miles an hour, it'll take you 16.5 days to get to the moon. It'll take you 17 years to get to the sun going 600 miles an hour, day and night. It will take you 690 years to get to Pluto. The earth is vast, the creation of God. The, the man, the, the, the God of creation who created all of this, he calls me a friend. Amen. I don't know. Come on. Man. In Jeremiah 31, 3, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. God speaks in the first person 3,800 times. This is one of the times. He says, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Jeremiah records it. Now, aren't you glad that you've been grafted into being God's people? God's people. We're God's people now. And then Romans 5 eight said, God showed his love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were yet a bunch of pitiful sinners. He sent him to die for us. Yes, while we were yet sinners. Wow. Now, I have alluded to what I'm going to give you next, but I've never given you this much before. So I'm giving you a little more so you can search it out a little bit more. I've mentioned some of this a while back. The Hound of Heaven. A famous piece of literature called The Hound of Heaven is a 182-line poem written by English poet Francis Thompson. First printed in 1890. The Jesuit J.F.X. O'Connor remarks on the Christian themes of the poem. The name is strange. It startles one at first. It is so bold, so new, so fearless. The meaning is understood. As the hound follows the hare, never ceasing in its running, ever drawing nearer in its chase with unhurrying pace, 
so does God follow the fleeting soul by His divine grace and love. And though in sin or only in human love, away from God, it seeks to hide itself. Divine grace and love follows after, unwearingly follows every after, ever after, till the soul feels its pressure, forcing it to turn to Him alone in that never-ending pursuit. No matter how hard we went out and tried to hide, no matter how much hiding and running, God's love kept pursuing us, tracking us until he caught up with us, loving us, changing us. Think about it. Before you came to Christ, the hound of heaven was pursuing you all that time. All that time. And some people's testimonies would go like this. Yes, I was running from God. Running, running, trying to hide, trying to do my own thing. But it's amazing. I do believe that people that go to hell, and there will be many and very many that will go to hell, if you can go back and trace their life, that hound of heaven, God's love, was tracking them and chasing them all through their life trying to pursue them, trying to love them, trying to woo them to himself. I think to go to hell, you've got to jump over, over a thousand Bibles, over a thousand circumstances to get there. Because God will do everything he can to pursue the soul of man. Commentator Kirsten Powers, Fox News commentator, in describing her journey from atheism to agnosticism to devout Christianity, Kirsten Powers of Fox News says, the hound of heaven had pursued me and caught me. John Stott's book, Why I Am a Christian, confesses that he is a Christian not because of the influence of his parents or teachers, nor to his own personal decision, but to be relentlessly pursued by the hound of heaven that is Jesus Christ himself. Aren't you glad and can you rejoice today that we have been pursued by the love of God and he has found us and he has changed us and he has saved us and he has given us eternal life. Amen. The hound of heaven sniffing out, searching, chasing relentlessly for the soul of man. In closing, Paul asked the question in Romans 8, 35. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation? Trouble? Distress? Persecution? Famine? Peril of sword? Paul says, no. No. None of these things in verse 37. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Paul finishes his affirmation, for I am persuaded. Listen, I want to ask you a question. Are you persuaded that God loves you? Are you persuaded that he loves you no matter whether you're good or bad or in between? God loves you, period. That's the point. It's his nature. He can't help it. He's God. His nature is love. He loves you. Not because you're perfect. Not because you do everything just right. Not because you never sin. Because that would be impossible. God loves us. Period. For I am 
persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels even principalities, powers things present, things to come heights, depths things above, things below shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord and everybody said amen, amen. come on come on we are blessed today to know that God loves me I know as children, which I've also given this illustration a number of times, but as children in the grassy knolls and in the fields, we would play the game, picking the petals off. God loves me, God loves me not. Or he loves me, or he loves me not. But it's the same thing. See, Satan kind of works on us, and we go back and forth. Well, well he doesn't really love you anymore, Satan says, because you're bad, because you made mistakes. Because you fail. He's a liar. Amen. And he's good at it. If you lie for 2,000 plus more years, you get good at it. And he's real good at it. He's real deceptive at it. Because he's been doing it for so long. Don't, don't doubt God's love for you. It's not based on how good you are. If you be a good little boy, your daddy will love you. Not this daddy. We're talking about God who has the capacity to love that way. The capacity to love that way. As we're approaching this Valentine's Day where we share our love with people. Be sure to tell some of your family, your friends, how much you care for them and love them. John 15, 12 says, Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Hmm. I put that in for Joni, because Joni we were at a, rest, a restaurant, and this lady that serves us, she works in her church with the children. She wanted to know what, what are some of the good scriptures to use. So while we were there, there eating pizza there in Pizza Cafe, I wrote, I got my phone out and wrote her a bunch of scriptures down for her to use for her children. And she said, oh, thank you, thank you, Pastor Dave. She's a real nice lady, and she loves working with her children at church. And uh, all week long, I thought I put these kind of. I looked at all. There's a lot of scriptures on the love of and the love, and love of God and Christ. But I try to put these together in a sequence that you could have for later to look at. But um, we're so blessed that we have the unconditional love of God 